Welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm your host, John Slickbaum, home of the fighter pilot, the United States Air Force Weapons School, Red Flag, the aggressors, going up range, student gap, I'll meet you over the farms, backed up against Stonewall Mountain, initial for sunrise break, and of course, off to the big house. That's right, this week, we're talking about Nellis Air Force Base. This is so important because there's a tried and true saying in the United States Air Force, so goes Nellis, so goes the Air Force. And this statement hits the mark these days more than ever, especially when we talk about how we develop tactics, techniques, and procedures to handle future threats that are going to press us for all we've got. So to talk about this fundamental cornerstone of the warfighter's development, we're going straight to the top by discussing Nellis Air Force Base with the 57th Wing Commander, Brigadier General Michael Johnny Bravo Drowley. Now, to bring you up to speed, the 57th Wing is not a normal wing. It's built around 21 squadrons that effectively represent all the core competencies and aircraft you'd find in the United States Air Force. So specific mission and aircraft curriculum is taught in the various squadrons, and then the total team is brought together for various exercises, including Red Flag. Their mission is to provide the world's most advanced training in weapons and tactics. Every six months, the weapons school produces approximately 80 graduates who rotate back to their home units and share what they've learned. In popular culture, this is basically what most people would recognize as Top Gun. But in the Air Force, we call it the weapons school. So here's some background on General Drowley. He's a career A-10 pilot with numerous combat deployments and over 2,000 hours in the Warthog. Now, there aren't many people that have spent as much time at Nellis Air Force Base as Johnny Bravo. He was a weapons school student and quickly returned as an instructor. School, then staff, and returned to Nellis as the Director of Operations and fleeted up as the commander of the A-10 Division, the 66th Weapons Squadron. Again, school and staff, and right back as the Commandant of the Weapons School, responsible for the entire program. That's 19 squadrons teaching 26 weapon instructor courses, four advanced enlisted courses, and 30 combat specialties at nine locations. General Drowley then went to the desert as a chief of staff of Central Command and then Wing Command at Davis Monthan, the home of the A-10. And now he's on his second Wing Command tour at the 57th Wing at Nellis. And he's responsible for 36 squadrons at 12 installations, constituting the Air Force's most diverse flying wing. And if this wasn't enough, he oversees the U.S. Air Force Advanced Maintenance and Munitions Operations School, the United States Air Force Thunderbirds, the Red Flag and Green Flag exercises, the adversary tactics group that includes the famous Air Force aggressors. Now, needless to say, we couldn't have found a better guest to talk about how the Air Force is preparing to face near-peer competitors like China and Russia, along with all of the other challenges around the globe where air power is going to be paramount. And to help me with this conversation, I'm also going to bring in the Dean of the Mitchell Institute, Lieutenant General David Tertula. Sir, welcome back to the Aerospace Advantage. Yeah, hey, Slick. It's, uh, it's great to be part of this. Well, sir, I know it's really easy for, uh, for us to get fired up on this episode. Uh, I mean, three fire pilots and three weapons officers talking about Nellis Air Force Base. It doesn't get any better than that. So uh, for anybody that's been there, Nellis is truly a magical place. And sir, in all of your experiences from a young punk flying the Mighty Eagle uh, to the highest levels in the Pentagon, what does Nellis mean for the Air Force? Well, you know, Slick, in your introduction, you did an excellent job highlighting everything that goes on out there. Um, I, I think what is going to be valuable for our audience when they hear General Drowley uh, speak is the absolute incredible degrees of integration that have been achieved across all the different mission areas that affect every element of air and space operations. I should say airspace and cyber operations. Uh, Integration, integration, integration is the key here. Uh, And when I went through weapons school um, back in 1981, um, it was the Air Force Fighter Weapons School. uh, And we didn't really incorporate intelligence, bombers, uh, cyber, space, And it really has made a difference because now what we do and what happens is at Nellis is at the captain level, people's eyes are open to the fact that it's not just their particular specialty, 
which quite frankly, that's why we send people at weapon school to weapon schools to be able to squeeze the the most that they can out of their particular uh, specialty and what they do. But at the same time, we open their eyes to understanding the integration that allows us to fight and win as an integrated, complete force. And in the past, uh, we were lucky for some people to get that awareness if they got involved in uh, joint operations or an actual conflict, but it didn't happen until they got there. Today, what Nellis does is it brings those different perspectives together at a very young age. And, and that, quite frankly, is what has made the Department of the Air Force the world's greatest air and space force uh, in the world. Absolutely, sir. And I'm just going to tell uh, one quick story uh, running an exercise. And we had a, a new space weapons officer uh, in the beginning and obviously someone who is a complete expert. But uh, we're trying to do BDA and could tell this guy was a little frustrated in the corner. He goes, oh, yeah, you know, I have a, a satellite, you know, covering that area, you know, I don't know, a couple times an hour. I, I, I could have told you uh, you guys hit the target, you know, half an hour ago. And we go, oh, why didn't you tell us? He goes, well, I, I didn't know you wanted to. But now they are so integrated into the fight and into the planning. It's uh, it's really, truly a incredible capability uh, under the entire department, as you mentioned. So with that, I'd like to welcome Brigadier General Mike Drowley. And General, welcome to the Aerospace Advantage. Thanks, Slick. I really appreciate it. General Deptula, sir, great to be here. Uh, this is outstanding, and I am completely humbled uh, to be on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Sir, you've been stationed at Nellis numerous times, climbing the ladder, so to speak, at each level, uh, and now you're the 57th Wing Commander. What's new, and how are things evolving since you first flew here as a WIC student? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the advice that I give personnel that come in here or some of our senior leaders that visit is that if you've been away for any more than six months, uh, the place has changed, and for the better. Uh, we're constantly evolving because we're constantly looking for ways to continue to get after the priorities of the Air Force and now our Space Force. Uh, from my personal vantage point, I, I am the biggest lottery winner in the Air Force because I've gotten to come through here uh, so many times. And so I'm extremely lucky that I get to see these problem sets and really get to see the top 1% of the Air Force and the Space Force get after those problem sets. Uh, from my history here, some of the biggest changes and evolutions that I've seen is, uh, you know, back in the day uh, when I was a lieutenant going through Red Flag or a brand new captain going through the weapons school, uh, it was based off of the former Soviet Union model and, and threats against against really uh, a conglomeration of enemy uh, factors that we tried to present as desired learning objectives for the students and for our red flag audience. Um, and the mantra that we preached was just do the best that you can do within your cockpit, within your capabilities, and that'll be enough to get the job done. Uh, we're not at that place anymore. It requires force packaging, integration, uh, exquisite capabilities coming together to really face the threats that we're challenged with today. And, and from that evolution, uh, I've really seen where we have crept closer and closer to parity versus the superiority and the supremacy that, that we really want as an advantage uh, from our red flags and from our weapon school integration events. And so the good news is, is that we, we have the right team in place uh, to get after the challenges that we're faced with. And, and like I said, as Nellis goes, so goes the Air Force, and we are constantly evolving to make sure that we're going in the right place. Uh, but from that standpoint, our North Star right now is China. And that is what the team is focused on. That is what we are really putting all of our efforts into. Um, and why a lot of the changes that we're embracing right now uh, are on that vector. Well, JB, um, as you just said, China is obviously the number one uh, threat. Um, and that's a great overview. Could you uh, spend uh, just a couple of minutes, if you will, uh, to inform our audience about just what are the significant changes that are occurring at Nellis to counter uh, China's growing prowess. Yes, sir. So it, as we focus on what I'll call that North Star, the, the China threat on what is driving a lot of our changes, um, it is really looking at how can we, A, put together the best adversary force uh, so that way we can train against it. Uh, how can we prioritize that across the entire spectrum? And that is space, the air domain, uh, the cyber domain, uh, to ensure that we have the right capabilities that are replicating the threat so that way we can put together our best tactics, our 
our best techniques uh, and ensure that we're learning as much as we possibly can and the force is ready to meet that threat or meet that challenge. I look at it as my primary responsibility is if we have an airman that looks at themselves in the mirror when the flag potentially goes up and says, I'm not ready for this, I have failed. And so that that is really what is driving our actions and our way forward. Uh, in the past, we kind of had a fictionalized uh, threat force that we would go up against and we would present challenges just to try and drive desired learning objectives. Uh, now the scenarios that we're anchoring ourselves against are really based within uh, the things that we see as potential kill chains, kill webs, target sets and problem sets that we'll be faced with within those scenarios or within those AORs in the Pacific theater and then the European theater. And so um, we've always gotten goodness from the training that we've gotten here. It is high end training, uh, but now we're really trying to dial it in uh, based off of what we see maybe in the four to five, uh, nine to 10 year time frame. And again, the big takeaways that we've gotten is uh, integrations, not a nicety. Uh, the things that we have to do to be able to synchronize um, are not just nice to haves, it, they are have to haves. And we have to make sure that our team is trained for that and ready for it. Well, sir, it's good to hear that uh, Limnadia is a threat that we're going to move past. So, yep, <laughs> for the, those the that have... Ocean defense, yes. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so, sir, can you paint a picture for us of how you see air power engaging against a future peer threat? And obviously, concepts like JADC2, uh, bigger fifth gen inventories, and ideas regarding standoff are challenging the, uh, or changing the equation. Yeah, absolutely. And, and like I mentioned previously, a lot of it comes down to the force packaging and the integration uh, that we need and that we have identified has to be there. Uh, and we've got to be able to do that under duress and under contact. And so what that means is we need to train our leaders to be able to operate under mission type orders, uh, operate in an environment that is uh, full of fog and friction, and still be able to know what the commander's intent is to be able to go out and achieve that. And to be able to achieve that, they have to be able to to bring together capabilities uh, based off the threat environment that they're operating in to say, this is how I'm going to get in, deliver my, in my weapons, whether those are standoff or at a, at a closer range, and then survive. So that way, now I can go back, I can combat turn and, and go back, right back and do it again. And so that's really what we're trying to create with the training environment that we have here, not only in the live fire fly arena, but also as we look at the virtual test and training center uh, from a simulated environment. So that way we can continue to present those problems, punish blue mistakes, and then make sure that we capitalize on the lessons learned uh, that we are gathering from it. And so uh, as we look at that leadership laboratory, that is the test and training range here, or we look at the, the classroom instruction and the briefings, um, that is really what we are centered on is how can we ensure the team is ready uh, to take on those challenges and it, and it really comes down to the level of integration and the force packaging and bringing the full complement of capabilities uh, together to get to to be successful well sir building off of that uh, how are you guys handling the growing and rapidly changing air defense threat variants that china and russia are uh, throwing at us yeah, so uh, part of that is the virtual test and training center that we talked about. So we have identified that as a critical capability. Uh, so that way we can quickly uh, build those environments, replicate those threats, and then get rapid iteration uh, in training and repetition uh, and putting new capabilities into those environments or uh, new tactics and procedures to try and figure out what our winning solutions are. So that that is one facet of it. Uh, the other in the live fly arena is is how can we best replicate the quality uh, of the threats uh, that we are going against? And so the great thing about uh, Nellis Air Force Base is what happens uh, here, you know, can almost only happen here when you look at the phenomenal airspace that we're afforded, uh, the availability of the threats uh, that are on the ranges that we're able to compete against. But we have to keep up with how rapidly uh, those threats are evolving uh, in the potential AORs that we may be going to. And so what that really means is software design threat capabilities that we can rapidly update and then and then train against. And, and again, it has to be comprehensive across the spectrum. It has to be cyber-based, space-based, uh, you know, ground-based that's fighting us to the air. Uh, and those are the things that we need to go against. And so from our own professionalized aggressor force, that is what they're trying to get after to make sure that we are challenged as much as possible. And then on the blue side, that is constantly what we are going up against to say, okay, how can we figure out how better to take these down, fluster them, uh, be successful against them uh, to, to make sure that we're achieving the objectives that we've been handed. 
So, JB, how do you see this new set of challenges uh, manifesting itself in in some of the major areas under your purview? I mean, uh, how B-52s will employ is a lot different than what F-22s will be asked to execute. Um, Over the last 20 years, we could flow essentially everyone over um, our target sets. But I think those days are gone. Even in Syria, we saw a dramatic escalation of the threat with double-digit SAMs and Russian uh, fifth generations in theater. What What are your thoughts in this regard? Yes, sir. So uh, what it has really meant for us is we no longer have the luxury of, again, just kind of staying in your lane, uh, in your block, in, in your job jar and doing your, your what I would call your primary job and, and hoping to be successful. What it means is everybody is interdependent on everyone else. And so where this used to be very much a what I would call a fighter based uh, center of excellence, uh, we've really identified that it is across the spectrum, across the domains. Um, area where everybody has to figure out how do I help somebody else out to be successful and achieve the effects that we're trying to achieve, which may mean a B-52 has primacy in delivering a standoff weapon in order to support the the low observable push that's going in to now service the targets that they're going against. It may mean that uh, we are dependent on space effects uh, doing the things that they need to be able to do so that way we can do the kinetic things that we need to do on, on the fighter side. Uh, all of that may be under, underpinned by by cyber capabilities, offensive and defensive. And so I think, uh, again, what we typically saw historically was this mindset of, I just need to do my thing. And if I do my thing, we'll be successful. Now everybody needs to really know what everybody else's responsibility is and how that all comes together uh, to achieve uh, the win that we're trying to get. Yeah, that's very good. Now, in the vein of training, which you uh, mentioned a little bit earlier and That's obviously a staple of uh, what goes on at uh, Nellis. Adversary air support's uh, obviously a very uh, high-profile undertaking. Uh, So could you inform our listeners, if you will, a little bit about what's going on in the realm of uh, adversary uh, air support, whether it's uh, organic and the evolution of the aggressors, the introduction of of fifth-gen as aggressors, as well as uh, contract uh, adversary air and uh, uh, give us an update on the, the current status of uh, adversary air at Nellis. Yes, sir. Yeah, that is, uh, I would say, one of our centers of gravity of, of what we need here in order to be successful. So when you think about professional teams or sports teams, you want the very best team that you can scrimmage against so to know that you're ready for the game. We have the exact same demand signal when it comes to our adversary air and our professionalized aggressors uh, that are out there. And, and that's an area where we need to make up some ground. So our uh fighter force that makes up the the aggressor squadron is 25 block 25 32 uh, vipers block 42 Uh, they've got some good capability but not on par of some of the evolutions and the changes that we've seen from our adversaries uh, that are out there Uh, we also have contract at air like you alluded to which gives us good capacity Uh, but right now we need to invest more in the quality. And so that's really what we're advocating for is that we need altitude, we need airspeed, we need advanced radars, and we need infrared um, uh, search and track capabilities, ERST, uh, to be able to to make sure that the capabilities that we're going up against are as robust and as capable as any en- enemy out there. Some of that we're, we're handling on us on our own. So we have F-35 uh, capabilities that are being flown by professionalized aggressors again to give us the best look. We have a plan to now stand up an F-35 aggressor squadron to help us provide that capability as well. And, and again, when we uh, put our demand signal out there for uh, for contractual help or those kind of things, it is really along the, the quality uh, that we could use. Uh, it, don't get me wrong, capacity is great too. We need a lot of targets to shoot at and a lot of uh, different targets out there to fluster our game, uh, but quality is where we're trying to make those investments right now for where we could use the best training. Well, sir, uh, dovetailing on that too, uh, we're living in a world where a broad range of new technologies, uh, as you alluded to, are going to enter the air power domain. And one of the most uh, high profile is manned and unmanned teaming or manned unmanned teaming or MUMT. Uh, how do you see integrating early versions of this technology at Nellis to better understand the art of the possible, uh, work on the tactics, better define concepts of operations and look for areas where technology can be improved and, and not to mention gain trust with the human partners that have to work with it? 
No, absolutely. Uh, when it comes to man on man teaming, um, I think there's a lot of potential there. Uh, and like we talked about right now, we are focused a lot on the quality of the capabilities that we have. But quantity has a, a quality all of itself. And uh, man on man teaming offers you that. Uh, and so where we're looking at it is not only on the blue portfolio, but also again on our aggressor side. And we think that the lessons learned from flying on both red with man on man teaming will help us inform on the blue on how best to utilize that and being able to get some exploratory work on the blue side will also allow us to take a look at how we would utilize it against the red. And so uh, we are interested in all the facets that you just mentioned. How do we make sure that it that it's safe and executable? How do we make sure that it, it maximizes our capabilities, uh, you know, and gives us a, a cost advantage when you look at uh, how many more sorties that we can put up with that capability. And so it, it's an area that we're just now digging into and, and we're, we're really interested to see where it takes us uh, as far as an advantage over uh, you know, some of the problem sets that we're trying to work. Um, what do you see, uh, or what can you tell us about fifth gen? How, how are you seeing this change in the way that we uh, fly and fight, especially with the F-35 increasing its numbers in the Air Force, uh, the B-21 eventually coming online, and uh, aircraft like the F-22 still standing as the world's most lethal uh, fighter. So what, what does it mean to create a fifth generation training environment? It, yes, sir. Uh, you know, when you look at, again, the, the weapon school red flag model of old, it really was the, the ace of the base was the guy who could kick the rudder, uh, lag roll appropriately, and, and then get into a position of advantage. That is still very important. Uh, but the ace of the base right now is the person that can manage the sensors, manage the data, uh, perform that integration real time in the air. Uh, and that really is the name of the game when it comes to the fifth gen fight, which is, again, why we want those capabilities here at Nellis and deep end test them and put them into environments where they can get a good solid work out in. Uh, and that's really what we're seeing is that the effect that we get when we integrate those capabilities together is the advantage that we need against those high end threats. And so uh, the more that we can bring them together and just not fifth gen, uh, but also when we talk about the electromagnetic spectrum, when we talk about space capabilities, when we talk about information dominance, uh, it, it is across the entire portfolio, but it really starts with those capabilities, how we can integrate them together and how best you quarterback the massive inflow of data to be able to to get after the problems and the targets that we need to get after. And you mentioned the electromagnetic spectrum. So how are you dialing up uh, uh, missions that are critical like electronic warfare and how do they fit into this equation? We really, as an Air Force, turned down our our focus on this area in the 90s uh, and now it's back in force. Uh, but how we achieve these effects in the digital information age is significantly uh, different with uh, fifth gen being a major part of the game. So how, how are you dialing up focus on these kinds of capabilities to grow new talent? Yes, sir. So uh, as you mentioned, that's been uh, unfortunately uh, an uh, unrecognized portfolio for quite a while. Our eighth weapon squadron, which is our air battle managers, have really been the keeper of the flames uh, for quite a bit of time. And then as we stood up our 32nd weapon squadron, which is our cyber squadron, uh, and some of our other uh, weapon school squadrons have been recognizing that we need to quickly get our arms around the electromagnetic spectrum in order to be successful. Uh, So for us, it's really really looking at how can we wield emerging technologies like 5G networks uh, to better pass information, uh, use those capabilities to best uh, network and ensure that we are uh, achieving the connectivity that we need. How do we characterize the environment? Because we got, we know we're going to have to map it out. We're going to have to see where our critical pathways are and, and where we want to fluster or exploit the enemies. Uh, it's going to be a dirty environment when you look at everybody's trons and, and all the different capabilities out there. Uh, and how do we make sure that our, our networks and our webs are robust enough to operate? And so it, it is an area that we're rapidly trying to set a high vector and a flight path and put a lot of thrust behind uh, because it, it's been neglected for a little bit of time. Uh, but we have some amazing experts that are out there that understand that it's not about certain slices of the spectrum that we're concerned about. It is the entire spectrum and, and we've got to own it and we've got to know uh, h- how it's mapped out and how we can best utilize it and defend it on our end and then exploit it and shut it down on our enemy's end. And that's what the team is getting after. No, that's a great, uh, great response. And uh, glad to hear that, you know, what you've been 
talking about so far is integration of these wide variety of capabilities. So let me touch on another one uh, that uh, is interjecting a, uh, uh, another challenge, if you will, and that's the Space Force is now a separate service. So how are space capabilities being integrated into the aerospace warfare concepts operation that you've been talking about? And I, I don't, I don't want you to, you don't, I don't want to put you on the spot for speaking for the Air Force Warfare Center commander, but do you still see uh, arrangements like uh, Space Force officers being assigned as the deputy to the Air Force uh, Warfare Center? Yeah, yes, sir. So, you know, when I went through the weapons school and when I was an instructor at the weapons school, uh, unfortunately, the level of integration that we were at was, hey, here's the fighter plan. Now sprinkle a little space onto that. And, and, and what can you do with this? And that was about the extent of it. It is eye watering to see where we are today. Uh, I Just this last class. I was so proud because uh, a weapons school student was standing up briefing, talking about the offensive counter air plan. And I remember thinking to myself, man, that is a solid fighter pilot. And it turned out it was a space student. Uh, and then I remember our F-35 students stood up and talked about the uh, requirements that we needed from the space offensive and defensive plan. And I, was, I thought I was listening to a space, one of our guardians. And, and that's the level of integration that we're at today. And we, we have to maintain that. We, like it is essential that we maintain that. And and so we have got a, a phenomenal relationship right now. I, I don't want to speak for the Air Force Warfare Center commander, but I, there's such a, a great uh, dividend that we get when the vice is, is from the Space Force. So that way we can ensure that ing integration is there. Uh, what we're hearing from the Space Force is that we want to keep and ensure the weapons school uh, continues to stay aligned. We have an extremely tight partnership when it comes to Red Flag uh, as well. And so uh, it, like we identified, you, you have to have those two capabilities uh, tied at the hip in order to be successful. We've identified it here and, and we can't retrograde. We have to continue the level of integration that we have because that that's what's uh, made us successful up to this point. We'll keep us successful. Well, sir, I want to ask uh, also about, uh, you know, the modern era of air power uh, obviously is fueled by cyber. It's the way that I taught it to my students, you know, it's the glue that makes the whole system work. So what does cyber mean today at Nellis uh, for operations like, you know, red flag and fortitude tests, the weapons school cur curriculum, et cetera. Is it still a bolt on that gets acknowledged or is it really exercised uh, and central to what you're doing? Yeah, and it's like it's another area where, again, when you look at it, it was kind of like, here's the plan. Now, cyber, what can you do with that? Or do you have any concerns with this? We are really trying to bake it in from the ground level up now. Uh, and so we have a cyber aggressor squadron uh, that that attacks us and try and punishes blue mistakes and looks for our vulnerabilities and, and make sure those are highlighted to us. And then on the red flag, the weapon school, the test side, we also look at what authorities do we need when it comes time to go offensive? How do we make sure that those capabilities are in place? Who are they supporting or how are we supporting it? And then same thing on the defensive side, how do we ensure from the ground level up that it is baked into everything that we're doing to protect those critical nodes that we have? And so when you look at cyber is really the space, you know, the, the force, the bloodline of the space force uh, and really what makes that, that capability do all the things that it's able to do. It's all throughout all of our other platforms and capabilities as well. And so our cyber force really underpins and is the foundation for all that they have a i would say a huge uh responsibility but they're delivering on how they can both defend and attack when the, when the time comes jb agile combat employment or ace has been getting a lot of attention as a potential concept of operations for dealing with the increased vulnerability to our air bases around the world um, so how, how's Nellis incorporating uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures uh, to support this CONOP? And have you considered or are you already testing command and control and logistics under attack to, for small deployments of combat aircraft? Yes, sir. Yeah. If you look at it from a building block approach, uh, fights on to knock it off, we're doing really well. But but how did we get there? What, what bases did we flow in from? What munitions were available to them? Were they under attack? What command and control are you operating under? And so that's really the next phase that we're looking at. Uh, along with red flag and some opportunities there, we also have our green flag exercise portfolio. And that's where we're looking at some agile combat employment opportunities where we can operate out of austere environments and operate 
uh, with limited command and control and figure out how do we get those mission type orders to execute. Our AMO school, our aircraft maintenance and munitions operations school, uh, is also heavily vested in ACE in how do those logistics work? How do we ensure our professionals are ready for them? And so in the red flag and weapon school integration exercise, we've started to add the element of tyranny of distance. Now we're also going to add into uh, the tyranny of distance plus out bases that may be under attack and limited command and control. Uh, so that that is uh, where we're going. I think General Regan said it best uh, at the at AFA when he said, hey, it's a thing, you know, and it is. And we're wrapping our arms around it going, OK, how do we ensure the force is prepared for this and they're ready to execute? Yeah, so I love, uh, you know, building in that logistics flow. And just one quick uh, story. Um, I remember uh, Nut Peterson, when he was my weapons officer in the triple nickel, we're doing uh, an exercise and they say, uh, exercise, exercise, you know, simulated lost tool in your cockpit. Uh, You need to RTB. And he goes, simulated, found it. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I'm not losing this sortie, but so obviously we're, we're integrating some of these, uh, real world logistic type issues, obviously well beyond a lost tool in a jet, but, uh, I just had to tell that quick story. 100%. Uh, yep. <laughs> so I just want to flow to, uh, thinking about, uh, our MQ nine community and, uh, they've obviously focused on a specific band of the threat environment over the last 20 years. Uh, but given the demands we see from our peer threats, uh, I think we're going to have to really uh, evolve how we use them. And uh, they're obviously not going to be flying in the heart of the threat zone, but they can still execute a broad range of key missions uh, further back as maybe sensor shooters to allow more uh, high-end aircraft to flow further uh, forward in the fight. Are you experimenting with these types of concepts? Yeah, absolutely. It's like, you know, it's it's interesting and it's, it's tough at the same time when you look at the strategy and prioritization and the need to make choices. Uh, we had some choices that we needed to make and a lot of that was, okay, we've been doing uh, things over in the AFSENT theater for quite a while, uh, but now we we are focused on this, this threat uh, and this priority. So you, you can't do everything. You have to turn some things off and what can we do to support that that may not be within the normal paradigm of either, you know, what was the original original idea, the original inception, and the MQ-9 is a great example of that. Uh, so they're they're still experts as far as providing uh, ISR and, and close air support and, and, and being able to target the things that they target. But now we're also looking at how do they mesh network? How do they provide uh, persistent, survivable options uh, that allows us to, to get a better sense of the battle space, uh, that allows us to improve our connectivity, uh, and, and that gives you some options to maybe hit targets on the periphery. And so uh, much like all of our platforms going, what can I do to now help support the objective that I've been provided? The MQ-9 is really leading from the forefront because that's that's what they were born into. And so they've been really leading the charge is looking at new creative and innovative ways on how a combatant commander could utilize their 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 capabilities. Uh, JB, listen, I want to uh, thank you for all of this. Uh, we know you're given all the things you're responsible for, uh, your time is very uh, valuable. So we appreciate you uh, illuminating uh, many of the things that you do. Now, our audience may not know this, but as we speak, the last weapon school class of uh, F-15C warriors is about to graduate. Uh, And as the only Air Force officer who's been fully combat mission qualified in the air superiority variant of the F-15 at every rank from Lieutenant to Lieutenant General. I look forward to seeing you out at the weapon school graduation in December. So keep up the great work and we'll see you then. Yes, sir. We'll do. Yes, sir. And on behalf of, of us running the aerospace advantage, thanks so much for, for being on the show today. Really appreciate it. No, it's like I thanks. Uh, I really appreciate it. Again, humbled by the opportunity to talk with the team. And what I would leave the audience with is uh, we're under crisis. We need to move and move fast. But what you can rest assured is the right team is here to get after these problems. They're an incredibly talented bunch, uh, and I'm honored to serve with them. And they can rest assured that no matter how large the challenge is, th- this team is going to get after it, and they're doing amazing work. I appreciate it, Slick, sir, and fights on. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to you, our listeners, for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hammer down on that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment for us to let us know what you think about our show or areas you would like to hear more about. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. And you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Until next time, this is John Slickbaum 
stay safe and check six.